How's everybody doing today? This is Pastor Matt Rohde, Springport Bible Church. Today is Sunday, May 3rd, and this is our morning worship service. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video as we kind of went over the different names of God. That's what we're going to be doing for a little while. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, before we get started, I uh, want to cover a few things. If you've never been a part of our service or attended our church, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what Springport Bible Church stands for. We are a Bible-believing church. What does that mean? We believe the Bible is 100% truth from the first page to the last. You don't add to it and don't take away from it to suit how you want to live. Uh, we also believe there's one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. You can't earn your way into heaven. You can't be prayed into heaven. You can't do enough good works to earn heaven. It's through admitting that you're a sinner, that you're in need of a Savior, and you come to the foot of the cross, and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Those are two things we believe in here strongly at Springport Bible Church, because that's what the Bible instructs us to do, is follow His Word. Um, and a few announcements here. Uh, first of all, uh, obviously, we're not having any activities throughout the week at this time at church. Uh, Wednesday night, small group, youth group, everything's canceled. Uh, you can still follow us on Facebook. I've been putting out daily devotionals, so if you follow Springport Bible Church, I've been doing daily devotionals to stay in contact with everybody. And then obviously, you can watch our sermons on YouTube. So, uh, no other things going on at this time. That being said, I have some good news. We are tentatively planning on starting church up again on uh, May 17th. I know many of you are excited to hear that. Uh, we plan on uh, getting church going. The details uh, still aren't there yet, but we're going to keep everybody notified over the course of the next couple weeks on how we're going to do it and the guidelines we're going to have to reopen church on the 17th of May. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are very, very happy to hear that. Uh, let me see. We have some birthdays this past week. Uh, DJ Hardigan, Linda Lewis, Barrett Sloan, termed five. Congratulations, Barrett. And Joy Strathman all had birthdays this past week. So we want to wish all of you a very happy birthday. Uh, for those of you that are still doing your tithes and offerings, we have two different options for that. Number one, you can use the Givelify app, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. And it's an app you can put on your phone or find it right on the computer. And you can find our church and you can uh, do your tithes and offerings through the app. And that goes right uh, out of your uh, 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 debit card or bank account. And then it goes right to the church. And then at the end of the year, if you want to, you can print off records for yourself for tax purposes for people that are still just wanting to write checks or give money here at the church the normal way. We have a lockbox right next door to the church entrance. Just lift up the flap, drop your tithes and offerings in there. And they are emptied out every day before it gets dark, so that money's not left out there. Uh, once again, I just want to say thank you for everybody that's been consistent with your tithes and offerings. It's been a true blessing where I hear a lot of churches are struggling. You guys are just being awesome right now with that, so I appreciate that. Uh, let me see here. Is there anything else? I don't think so. Um, so at this time, we have a very very, oh wait, I almost forgot. Reagan Kaiser completed the Bible Memory Verse Challenge this week. Good job, Reagan. Good job getting that done. And uh, Monday, I will have the new Bible Memory Verse Challenge out to you guys for the kids. Uh, at this time, we have a very special guest. If you attend Springport Bible Church, you all know him. We all miss him and his family as they moved out west. But Kirk Allen has sent us a song that we're going to play for service today. I hope you guys enjoy it. I've been held by a Savior 
I feel fire from above I've been down to the river Made the same prodigal return I'm no stranger to prison I've wore shackles and chains I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back I'll never be the same That's why I sing Yes, it is. All my sins I've forgiven. I'm washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man. Break him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Yes, I have. You pick me up. You show me what it means to be a man. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday gone. Yes, they are, cause I've been washed by the blood. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins I've forgiven. Yes, they are. I washed by the blood. Thank you, Kirk. It was great hearing from you. We appreciate you sending us that song. Uh, now, people that we need to be praying for. We need to be praying for John Evans Sr., Molly Manchester, Dax Ryan, uh, Dax, Dax now uh, has to be on oxygen consistently, so please keep that little uh, newborn in your prayers. Barb Black, the Mead family, David Dak. I'm sure David's looking forward to getting back in church. It's been a lot longer than six, seven weeks for David. Uh, please be praying for Joyce Strathman. James Wilkie, the Wheeler family, Billy Dugan, Dale Marsh as he continues cancer treatments. And Tom Smith, that's a friend of the Doubtings who is in hospice. And then just like always, we want to be praying for our frontline workers. Uh, so uh, Jessica Carpenter, Sarah Taylor, and then Carol Keita and Joe's daughter is also a nurse as well. So we want to please continue to be praying for our frontline workers as they are out there every day doing a great job. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to lift you up today, Lord. Lord, we want to thank you for technology, Lord, that we can still have church together even though we're in our own homes. And Lord, we just, uh, we just lift up everybody in the prayer chain today, Lord, the people that are going through different struggles and issues and problems. And 
Lord, there's so many things right now that people are just uh, dealing with. It's just absolutely hard to comprehend. And Lord, uh, many are dealing with uh, family issues right now, Lord, as they struggled to, um, to interact with some of the people within their house, Lord. And they haven't been around each other for this long at one time. And Lord, we just pray you give everybody a sense of peace and calm uh, as they are with each other. And Lord, there's so many people dealing with financial struggles right now, Lord. We just, we just call on you, Lord, to be our provider. And it's one of the names we're going to talk about uh, in a sermon uh, later on down the road is how you are our provider. And Lord, there's many people now, they need you to be their provider. So Lord, we just call upon you today, Lord. And Lord, uh, last of all, Lord, we would just pray that you would heal those who are sick. Lord, protect those who are not. We ask, Lord, you give our leaders extra wisdom as they navigate this pandemic and economic uncertainty. Lord, we ask that you'd strengthen our church globally, Lord. Reveal to us how we can partner together to reach the needs of those around us. Lord, we ask you would calm our fears. Fill us with hope and joy and peace as we continue to trust in you throughout all this. Lord, we would ask that you would use this pandemic to pave the way for spiritual renewal, Lord. We want your glory, your power, and your healing to be on full display. And my goodness, are we seeing it, Lord. We're seeing so many great things uh, happen and people come to Christ through everything that's going on in our country right now. So Lord, we just call upon you, Lord, and we ask all of these things. Give us a great service today. In your heavenly holy name we pray. Amen. At this time, there is a uh, song that is done by Hillsong United, and it's the, uh, actually the title of my sermon today, Elohim, and it's a great praise song. I hope you guys enjoy it. Kingdom 
What an awesome song by Hillsong United there, El Ohim, which is the title of our sermon today, Elohim, our strong creator. Elohim, our strong creator. Now, I've been given many names throughout my life. I've been given many names. Uh, I remember one of my first names was by my grandma Keefe. My grandma Keefe used to call me Charlie Brown. That was her nickname for me, Charlie Brown. I believe she called me that because the size of my head that I had as a uh, baby and small child and still have a large head today. But my grandma Keefe called me Charlie Brown. My uh, papa, who was from the deep south, he called me Machu. Machu. I'll never, I'll never forget him calling me Machu. And my uncle Bud, uh, papa's brother, used to call me Hoss. Come here, Hoss. How you doing, Hoss? After that uh, guy from that TV show, Bonanza, he called me Hoss. And that's why I call a lot of people Hoss today from uh, Uncle Bud. And all of us know uh, when we were called by our full name, Matthew James Rohde. Typically when our mom or dad said that, we knew we were in trouble. That was one of our names. I had a nickname by my teachers in school. Uh, instead of calling me uh, Rody, they called me Rowdy because I was uh, normally causing some sort of disturbance. So my nickname by my teachers were Rowdy. Uh, when I was in high school and the first couple years of college, uh, I did a lot of steroids. So my nickname back then, instead of Matt Rody, they called me Matt Roydy. They called me Roydy. So that was my nickname back then. And then obviously now I'm a pastor. Uh, so a lot of people call me Pastor Matt. That's one of my names, Pastor Matt. Uh, girls on the mission trip one year that I took down years ago were trying to get my attention, and they accidentally called me, instead of Pastor Matt, they called me Master Pat. And that has stuck. There's little kids in this church here now that call me Master Pat because they say it, they say it too fast and they flip the letters. So there are still kids that are in uh, their 20s now call me Master Pat. Uh, my uh, kids both call me daddy. Uh, Noel's 21, Gage is 16, and when they're trying to get my attention, they say, daddy, 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 daddy. So I still get called daddy from my kids. Um, but most people call me roadie. Uh, uh, I don't know why, but I've just always been called roadie instead of Matt. So uh, a lot of people call me roadie. I've been called other names that I cannot repeat here. I've been called a lot of other names. I've been given some names behind my back as well. There are some names that I'm sure people have said about me behind my back, just like you. People have made up some names about you behind your back. And while I can't control how people refer to me, um, uh, I can always um, love what I'm called or not love what I'm called. So my question to you today is this, what do you want to be called? What do you want to be called? Um, I, I just like to be called Matt. Just call me Matt. You don't have to call me Pastor Matt or Reverend Matt or Minister Matt or Minister Rody or Pastor Rody. Just call me Matt because I'm, I'm Matt. I like, I, I, I like to be called Matt, so feel free to call me Matt. But as we continue talking about the names of Jesus, there's or not of Jesus, but of uh, God. There's many different names that God has. And in an even greater way, uh, God has been given many names for us to use so that we can refer to him. Last week, we talked about Jehovah Nissi, which is God is our banner. And we kind of talked about how we are uh, living a life and moving ahead and we need to focus on something. And we focus on the God's banner. We can follow a lot of banners, but we follow God's banner. And because of him having that banner, we know that he's fighting for us and that we're called to not just let him fight for us, but, but, but as believers in Christ and him fighting for us, we fight alongside him and we follow his banner. So that's, 
That's kind of what we covered last week. And today we're going to look at his very first name. The very first name that was ever used in the Bible for God. We're going to look at that name. And that name is Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. Elohim. Now that name is used in the Bible over 27,000 times, or I'm sorry, 2,700 times in reference to God. 2,700 times. But what's really cool is that in the book of Genesis, just in the first chapter alone, God is referred to as Elohim 32 times. Just, just in the first chapter of Genesis. Now, if you ask a biblical scholar what Elohim means, uh, what they will tell you is that um, uh, obviously from the first part of the word El, which, which in turn comes from the word to be strong, to be strong. And specifically, that name means that he is our strong creator God. He is our strong creator God. So, so when we pray to Elohim, our strong creator God, we, we need to remember that God is uh, creatively powerful and that he is completely sovereign and that he is gloriously great. So my sermon today is just kind of an encouragement. I'm kind of tired of talking about coronavirus stuff and tie it in with that. I want us just to focus today on the strong, creator, awesome God we serve. Instead of looking at the problems around us and what's going on, let's just, let's just focus on what an awesome God we serve today, our strong creator. Now, the book of Genesis gets its name from the Hebrew word, and it literally, it literally means the book of beginnings. The book of beginnings. Now, now, in our society right now, this book is also a battleground, in my opinion. Today, many in our culture totally reject it and its clear teachings. They call it a fairy tale, and they, t- and they call it a lie, because we all came from goo, and we climbed out of the swamp. So... We don't have time this morning to dig into every single detail when it comes to the depths of this. But the bottom line is this. You have a choice. We as believers in Christ have a choice to make. You can either believe what the Bible teaches. You can either read it and say exactly what I said at the start of our sermon. That, that, our, that our Bible is 100% truth from the first page to the last. You can either believe what the Bible teaches, and if you do that, I'm here to tell you right now, you are the rebel. You are the rebel. A lot of people think Christians are sheep, and they just kind of do what they're told, this and that. I'll tell you what, if you believe what the Bible says, you aren't part of the sheep, you are part of the rebellion. Because you are definitely swimming against the current of our culture. No doubt about it. You're swimming against the current of our culture. Or, if you wanted to, you throw all that out the window and follow the crowds and say, you know what? It's a really cool story about how God did some stuff and he created this and created that. It's a really cool story, but there's no way it's true. There's no way it's true. You can be at odds against Elohim, or you can be on his side. Choice is up to you. But because God calls himself Elohim, there are at least four foundational facts that I want to touch on today. Four foundational facts that we see at the very first chapter of Genesis. And we see the very first name of God, our strong creator. So I want to look at these, break them down for you today. Right now, if you need to go get a pen and a piece of paper, go get them so that you can jot this stuff down. And then also get your Bible ready because we're going to be going through some verses. Whenever I start to read a verse, go ahead and pause the video, pause YouTube, whatever, and find it in your Bible so that you can follow along as I read it. Okay, so there's four foundational facts that we see as God being our Elohim, our strong creator in the book of Genesis. The first one is this, Elohim is eternal. Elohim is eternal. Now, 
the very first verse of the entire Bible, Genesis 1.1, it says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Years and years and years ago, there was a bunch of guys that were working with one of the first supercomputers. And remember how giant and big those supercomputers back in the 50s and 60s and 70s used to be? So they, they were trying to answer the question, where did earth come from? Where did earth come from? And they figured that the supercomputer could figure it out. So they compiled all this data and they punched all this stuff into the supercomputer and they added this and they added this and they added that and they fed it into the highly sophisticated computer back in the 60s. And they pushed the answer button and with, and with the beeping and grumbling and noises that, the, that, that all those old supercomputers made, do you know what the answer that the computer spit out was? See Genesis 1.1. See Genesis 1.1. Now, the computer had it figured out, but unfortunately, a lot of people today don't. They don't have it figured out. They don't get it. So let's do that right now. Let's look again at the first four words. In the beginning, God. Now, God in this piece of scripture is referred to, remember what I said, Elohim. In the beginning, our strong creator. Now, this is a declaration. I want to clarify this. This is a declaration that God has always been. He had no beginning and he will have no end. In fact, it's stated strongly in Deuteronomy 33.27. Go ahead and look there and pause it. Deuteronomy 33.27. It says, The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. The eternal God is our refuge. Augustine was once asked what God was doing before he created the world. And Augustine stood there and he contemplated it for a little bit, and he thought about it, and he looked at the man that answered the question, and he said, I'll tell you what he was doing. He was creating it for people who ask ridiculous questions like that. (laughs) Now, I I want us to really think about this. Did you notice that it is a simple declaration that Elohim exists? And it does not provide an explanation of how God got here, where God came from, how he was originated, how it all, all... all all got started. It just said, in the beginning, Elohim, our strong creator. The Bible assumes that he is and that he's always been. Years ago, I went to Promise Keepers over at the Pontiac Silver Dome in the Detroit area. And I had the honor to listen to Pastor E.V. Hill. And he is a black pastor and he's from the South. And he's one of my favorite preachers to listen to, Dr. E.V. Hill. And he was talking about how people always try to overthink God. And I loved how E.V. Hill would say God. He would say, God, God. And it was just so great to listen preach. And And he's talking about how people overthink God. And he said, you might wonder where God came from, and where he's going. And he said, I'm here to tell you, God is. God just is. Now think about that. Think about that. God just is. He is always going to be there. God is. He is eternal. That that story kind of reminds me of a boy who uh, he was... He was getting ready. He was a little eight-year-old boy. He was getting ready to pray for uh, his family's dinner. And they're all sitting around the table. And he says, Dear God, please take care of my daddy. Please take care of my mommy. Please take care of my sister and my little brother. And God, please, please take care of my doggy. And then he said, Oh, 
And please take care of yourself, God. Because if anything happens to you, we are going to be in a big mess. Now, think about that. That is so true. Isn't it reassuring just knowing that God is? That God is. He is here today. He was here yesterday. And he'll be here tomorrow. We don't ever have to worry about anything happening to God because he just is. He's always going to be there. Now, I don't know about you, but that is reassuring for me. He was, he is, and he will be. You can count on him always. He is eternal. Psalm 14, verse 1, tells us that only a fool believes there is no God. Only a fool believes there is no God. So if you sit there today and you're saying, well, I don't know if all this God stuff is real. Well, I'm here to tell you right now that the the Bible addresses that. If you can look around and think there's no God, no strong creator, guess what? You're a fool. Because if you look around and you can't see that, my goodness, you're not looking hard enough. God is. He is eternal. Number two, number two, creation is correct. Creation is correct. The first one was God is eternal. Second one was creation is correct. Now, because God alone is eternal, that which is created is not. Think about that. Look, look, look at, look at, look at the last part. God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for create means to literally create out of nothing. So, so in this piece of scripture, it says there was nothing there and yet God made something out of it. There was nothing there, but our strong creator made something out of it. Our strong creator God, our our Elohim, he brings design out of disorder. He created the cosmos out of chaos. He birthed beauty out of barrenness and nothing. And he continues to do the same in our lives today. If you sit there today, he's doing the same thing in your life right now. He's turning chaos into something, and he's turning barrenness into beauty. That's what he does. That's what he does. So let's look at a few more verses there in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3. It says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be light. And there was light. Now, it's no accident that the first thing God wanted us to know about himself is that he is our strong creator. He is our Elohim. The whole revelation of Scripture, in my opinion, is rooted in the fact that from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, that God is our strong creator. I once, I once heard it said that the three most important books of the Bible are Genesis, Revelation, and Romans. Genesis, Revelation, and Romans. Genesis tells you where you came from. Revelation tells you where you're going. And Romans tells you how to get there. Is that great or what? Is that great or what? Acts 17.24 Acts 17.24 tells us this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Now just based on that verse right there alone, even if you're at home today and you're enjoying church and you're not in church, God doesn't live in temples. God is with you right now while you're having church, watching this on TV or internet. Isn't that cool? Revelation 4, verse 11, 
Revelation 4.11 says this, You are worthy, O O Lord and God, to, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their being. And they have their being. The early church viewed the doctrine of creation as the beginning point of theology. That's where it all starts. Genesis tells us where we came from. And it's a bedrock of biblical belief. Now, a lot of people think it's a fairy tale, but we as, we as Christians know that our, our, our Elohim in the book of Genesis is the bedrock of what we believe. And, and its, its importance is summed up at the very beginning of the Apostles' Creed. You remember that? You remember that? I believe in the God and the Father Almighty and the Creator of heaven and earth. That's what we believe. That our strong Creator put this together and that's the God we serve. It didn't evolve. It didn't slowly happen. But this is the God we serve. This is where it all started was the book of Genesis. Former atheist, Lee Strobel, wrote a book called The Case for the Creator. And if you've never heard Lee Strobel's story, it's awesome. He was an atheist, set out to prove that all the God and Bible and everything was all a fairy tale. And in the midst of studying, he actually gave his heart to Christ. Well, this is, this is what he wrote in the book, The Case for the Creator. It says this, that when he researched the central pillars of evolutionary theory, They quickly rotted away when exposed to scrutiny. The whole uh, 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 crawling out of Pongu does not add up. When it's exposed to scrutiny and really looked at, it's a bunch of baloney. And this is a guy who was an atheist. Now another thing, another story about a guy who was an atheist. Anthony Flew, who for half a century has been the leading champion of atheism and perhaps the most famous, has recently said that a superintelligent being is the only good explanation for the origin of life and the complexity of nature. And this is in his own video called Has, has Science Discovered God? Flew, Flew actually states... DNA has shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangement uh, by the arrangements which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have been involved. This is coming from an atheist, and he's literally saying, <coughs> after looking at the complexity of just human DNA, there's no way this could have just happened. Somebody had to have put it together. Creation is correct. On the Apollo 8 mission, on the Apollo 8 mission, there was three three astronauts on Christmas Eve in 1968. In the Apollo 8 mission, they they circled the dark side of the moon and they started heading home. And as their tiny capsule floated through space and they got closer and closer, they gazed on earth. They, they looked out of their capsule window and they gazed on earth. Now, what do, you, what do you think they did? They did not quote Einstein. They didn't quote a poem from Shakespeare. They didn't quote Darwin. They didn't quote something from the from the latest uh, uh, science novel. No. There was only one statement that they could make to capture the magnificence of seeing Earth from that capsule. From that capsule. They, they, They looked down, and these are the words that they said. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, that, is, that is what they said and what was recorded 
from what they saw when they looked out the window. They looked at earth and they didn't quote Shakespeare or Einstein. They quoted the Bible. They saw the creation and said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the only thing that makes sense. That's the only thing that makes sense. Now, God's creation of the worlds of planet Earth has the most invisible qualities that we can't see but we know are there. His eternal power and divine nature that God has have been clearly seen, they've been clearly understood. So it makes it makes no it makes no sense. You have no excuse to throw that out the window. If you just look around, you will see that we serve a God that created all of this. That's what he did. He is a creator. He is greater than that which he has created. And that means you can trust him because there is nothing in your life that is greater than he is. Everything we have, all of this, God put together. So why not worship the creator instead of the creation? That only makes sense to me. Number three. Number three. The Trinity is true. The Trinity is true. Number three. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, says this. Then God said... Let us make mankind in our own image, in, a, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, that God, cre- so, so God created mankind in his own image. In, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, the third application for this name, Elohim, I want you to get this, is actually an allusion to the Trinity. The I am ending in Elohim is a plural suffix. Now, for those of you that are an English teacher, then you guys will be able to pick up on this, but I'm going to explain it. This is similar to cherub being cherubim, or seraph being Seraphim. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a cool part I want you to think about. Although the name Elohim is plural, it is often tre- uh, treated as a singular noun. So, I want us to go ahead and look back through that piece of scripture. It says, then God, Elohim plural, said singular, let us plural, Make man in our plural image. In our, in our, that's plural, likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock, over all the earth. And, and, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God, Elohim, that's plural again, created man in his, that's singular, own image. In the image of God, Elohim, plural, he singular created him, male and female. He singular, a singular again, created them. Now, what really jumps out to me is that whole first part. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now, while, while this verse alone doesn't fully develop the doctrine of the Trinity, here we see that God is one, one, yet somehow plural. Us, our. You get that? Did you hear that in that, in, in that piece of scripture? He is yet one, yet he is somehow plural. Now, God who is eternal in nature has always existed in three persons. And we hear that at the beginning of the Bible is what's so cool. This concept is found throughout Scripture. When Jesus Jesus gave the Great Commission to his church, he called on all 
three members of the Trinity in Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19, therefore, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He addressed all three at that point. One of the clearest passages, in my opinion, is found in 2 Corinthians 13, 4. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. He covers all three. He covers all three. So have you picked up yet that all three of our points so far are hot button issues? Okay, the, the name Elohim establish, establishes that God exists, that he is a creator and that he is three in one. He's three in one. And those are all things people disagree with and they don't like talking about. And while three truths have their, and while all three of these truths have their people that disagree with them and stir up controversy, a lot of controversy, there's still one more application that flows out of this that I don't want to miss. And this one even generates more, more arguments and more discussions than the other three I talked about. And that's number four. <clears throat> number four. Every person has a purpose. Every person has a purpose. Genesis 1.27 says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, the third application from the name Elohim, our strong creator, is, um, is probably our most important point. Simply put, every person, every person is made in the image of God. Every person is made in the image of God and therefore has dignity, worth, and purpose. The word created is used three times and we, are, we were told twice that humans are made in the image of our God. Now, the, the late Francis Schaeffer, awesome, awesome believer, the late Francis Schaeffer once, once said that if I had to if I had an hour to spend with a person on an airplane and they didn't know who the Lord was, I would take 55 minutes. I would take 55 minutes and I would talk about man being created in the image of God. And then I would take the last five minutes on the presentation of the gospel and I'd talk to him about salvation. And I talked to him about how that salvation can restore them to what the original plan that God had for them was. Now, that's a powerful statement from, from, from somebody that was probably really good at sharing their faith. I love what President Bush said years ago. He, uh, he was talking on this topic, and he said that we share a great goal to work towards the day when every child is welcomed in life and protected in law. To build a culture of life, affirming that every person at every stage in every season of life is created equal in God's image. Ecclesiastes 11.5 says this, As you do not know the path, or the wind, or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. That is a powerful verse. As you do not know the path of the wind, or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God and the maker of all things. One of the greatest inventions, in my opinion, was the um, invention of the ultrasound. The ultrasound, we can now see pictures of the unborn and watch their development. And it is there where we have a window to God's creation. 
we have a window to the womb. Amazingly, God is a creator and he is intimately involved with us because he made us. It's that simple. His constant concern for us is simply the natural interest that a maker would have for a very special product. We are his special product. We are his creation. We belong to him, and he belongs to us. Now, there's some good news. There was a poll taken a little while ago, and it said that more and more adolescents, right now it's at 58%, more and more adolescents think that abortion is immoral. That, uh, that abortion is literally morally wrong. Now, these are, this is our younger generation. 58% are, are starting to look, because of all these technology advances we have with ultrasound and all this stuff, and they're saying, oh my goodness. This, this isn't just a bunch of cells. This is a human being. They're starting to get it. Listen, listen to what the owner of, the Oregon, of Oregon's largest abortion clinic testified to under oath. He literally said this. He said, of course, human life, that it begins a conception. It is an indisputable scientific fact that each and every surgical abortion in America stops a beating heart. That was, that was a guy that ran the largest abortion clinic in Oregon. After he'd worked there that long, he realized that every abortion stops a beating heart and it stops a creation. In 1999, an unborn child named Samuel, some of you might even like remember this, it was all over the news. This unborn child was operated on for spina bifida. And his photograph in Life magazine, and I encourage you to go and look up this photograph on Samuel from 1999. His photograph in Life magazine captured the entire world's attention. During surgery, this unborn child, Samuel, reached out of the womb during surgery and grabbed the surgeon's finger. Grabbed the surgeon's finger. You've got to go find that picture. It's it's amazing. But what I didn't know that I found out a while ago, what I didn't know is that photojournalist Michael Clancy went from being pro-abortion to being pro-life because he was in there and he witnessed the procedure. He witnessed the procedure and he recorded it with his camera. And he watched that little hand come out and grab the doctor's finger. And he was quoted as saying, <clears throat> I was totally in shock. For two hours after the surgery, I was totally in shock. I know abortion is wrong now. It is absolutely wrong. I was pro-choice. Now I am pro-life. John 10.10 10 says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Have life and have it to the fullest. Every person has a purpose, you realize that. Whether born, whether unborn, whether rather infant, rather elderly, everybody has a purpose. I was reading a little while ago about a soldier who came back from the Middle East. And his whole identity was being a soldier. And he came back to America and he struggled with his identity. He struggled with the things he saw over there. And he, and he reached out to this person, reached out to that person. And he just felt like he no longer had a purpose. He no longer had a reason. Well, this young man ended up taking his own life. And he left a letter, and in the letter, it simply said, I no longer know what I'm here for. I no longer know what I'm here for.
many of us struggle so many times with viewing ourselves as having a purpose and being important in God's plan. And if you're sitting there today and you're struggling with what's going on and you're trying to find your purpose and you're trying to find your reasoning for being here right now and dealing with all this stuff, I'm here to, t- I'm here to tell you right now, we serve a, st- a strong creator He's created you for a purpose and for a reason, and you're here not by accident. Just like that unborn child, that a plan is laid out for that child. A plan is laid out for you. You're here for a reason, and you have a purpose. Don't give up hope. Keep fighting. Keep moving forward. God is using you in some way, shape, or form. Even if you can't see it, God is using you. Elohim, our strong creator. We can trust him in what I call four therefores. Four therefores. God is eternal. Therefore, his existence is established. God has always been. He always will be. Creation is correct. God created everything. Therefore, evolution is an error and it's a lie. It's an error and and it's a lie. You need to just accept it because that's what the Bible tells us. God created this. Number three, the Trinity is true. Therefore, redemption can be received. Because of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, we can have redemption through Jesus Christ and we can accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and a peace of God, the Holy Spirit, comes and is living in us so we can have redemption. And number four, every person has a purpose, therefore everyone has value. If you sit out there today and you question stuff, you question who you are, you have value to God. Don't you ever doubt it. You are priceless to God. I'm so grateful for Elohim, our strong creator. He continues, he continues to recreate today and work on our tomorrow. He loves to forgive. He loves to wipe away guilt and he loves to wipe away shame. And today, guess what? He can give you a fresh start if you will turn to our Elohim, our strong creator, and quit following and worshiping yourself. We serve a strong creator, and he created us with a purpose. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we, uh, Lord, we call on you today, Lord, to help us understand, Lord, exactly what you are. You are not a far-off God, but you are our strong creator. You put together, you formed everything, and you created us. And Lord, there's so many people out there right now, I know they're struggling with different things, but Lord, help us to realize the awesome God we serve the awesome God we serve. And if you sit there today and you say, you know, Pastor Matt, uh, I've walked around most of my life without a purpose, without a reason, without knowing why I'm here. And I just, I can't figure it out. I feel like I'm here for no reason at all. I'm just going through life. Well, guess what? You serve a strong creator that created you for a purpose. So right now, if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ and finally find that purpose, I'm going to give you that opportunity. It's time for you to start following the strong creator. Where you sit, if you're in your car, pull over right now. And I want you to pray this prayer and get right with God. If you're sitting on your couch, bow your head, shut your eyes. And and I want you to pray this prayer and call out to God and accept him as, as your Lord and Savior. Just say this, say, dear Lord, today I ask you to come into my life. 
I ask you to forgive my sins, save my soul, and take me to heaven when I die. Make me the type of person you want me to be. If you prayed that prayer right now, guess what? You have a purpose, and it's Jesus Christ. Man, I hope you prayed that prayer if you hadn't yet in your life. Lord, continue to work on us, Lord. Let us search your your holy word and find uh, names, Lord, that jump out at us, Lord, about you being the provider and our banner and our strong creator, Lord, that we realize just how awesome you are and that we would never take you for granted. Lord, we love you. And we want to thank you, Lord, for a day to worship you and honor you. And we ask this in your heavenly holy name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please call the church, 517-857-4008. Leave a message that you prayed that prayer. Or send me a message through Messenger on our Facebook page so that I can reach out and contact you and let you know what the next step is in growing in your faith. I want to thank everybody for being a part of this today and our motto here at the church, bringing the unchanging truth of Jesus to an ever-changing world. Bring that truth wherever you go this week and show everybody our strong creator. I love you guys. I meet you. I, I, I'm, I'm going to meet you on the 17th when we all come back. Uh, I love you guys. I miss you guys. And we are going to be back together real soon. Have a great week, everybody.